Eric has a question right away, and we can just keep the discussion going <coughs> by throwing it open to, to both uh, presenters. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, I think this is uh, a, good, a good thing to ask both of you. Could we maybe try to define some of these terms, uh, like sympathy, empathy, compassion, because I feel like there's, um, I have a murky understanding of the d distinction between those things. Don't ask me to do it because I can't tell the difference between empathy and compassion either. I mean, the general category is other uh, living, feeling creatures have internal states. And we have a certain capacity to perceive what those internal states are. Whether it bothers us or not, I guess what we mean by compassion is, I can tell you're suffering, but I don't give a... Right? That's not compassion, that's, and that's not empathy either. But I can't draw a wedge between empathy and compassion, can you? Well, I see the difference compassion suffering with. We're already in a situation of suffering. And in my advocacy, I, want, I, I would like to people to engage with non-human animals in a very positive and reciprocal uh, way. Animals can experience joy, they play with us. So, of course, I'm envisioning uh, a world where non-human animals are, are, are happy. Right? So I'd like to really think about how we begin to encounter the animal with respect, with respect, and in the more egalitarian terms, before suffering begins. I don't know if this is useful. How do you feel about euthanasia of pets? Well, there's euthanasia. Yes. When it's when yeah. How do you like, like you know? Okay, some like animal. Um, you you have a pet at home, and you know. How do you feel? Like, is that the same as at the slaughter? How, how would you define that, you know? Would you like to answer that? It's an easy well, one. What, why Very do, easy why one. Why do you ask that question? Because I'm just asking, because that's a pet. And you, like, how, how would you differentiate <coughs> feeling? Like, you know, I just oh, want no. to... But it, what could be simpler? You euthanize a, an animal, a, a, a family animal, if they're suffering so much that, you, that, that it's worse for them to keep living than to die. When you slaughter an animal, you slaughter an animal for no reason. You cause it to suffer for no reason because of something you want from the animal. There's no connection between euthanasia, which is mercy killing, and merciless exploitation. So the difference hinges up upon euthanasia versus murder, to really, yeah. you know, to really make it clear the difference, and not about who, you know. But does the animal decide whether it wants to go or not? That's a problematic yeah, question. Amazing. That's a problematic yeah. question, and this is yeah, the yeah, same with putting, human beings. Same put, problematic. Putting, uh, putting the animal out of your own misery. Right. So the, the fundamental question is, do I have the right to decide yeah. for a non-human or a human being? Mm. There's no difference with regard to species. What about uh, human beings? She just said there's no yeah. difference. Capital punishment. Um, um, armies. Right, right. Um, police. Right. You're armed. Would you advocate to banning the Canadian army? I'm not even a Canadian citizen. I will not answer this question. Uh, However, my background... Are you? So don't evade. My, but, but my background is the Frankfurt School and the experience and the realities yeah. of the Holocaust. Yeah. The way I approach cultural critique is in the sense of the way uh, Adorno puts it, a total cultural critique, and we are in urgent need of it. Mm. And that includes capital punishment, Prisons. I mean, look at who's being imprisoned in the United States. I mean, I don't know how many political prisoners are in there. Mentally ill prisoners, uh, uh, underprivileged uh, uh, women. Uh, it's an easy one. It's an easy one. So if, would you advocate um, soldiers who are going to fight ISIL to protect uh, the people that they are exploiting uh, in Syria and Iraq? Why are you asking me this question? I'm not in a situation of power. I no, could not decide. I could not decide. You are not in a position of power in the abattoir, in the veterinary surgeon, in the prisons. This is just an argument which I often get. And just, you can't evade it by just saying, it's not my responsibility. Am I saying it's not my responsibility? Yeah, you say it's this is not my area. I, I am in relation to, let's say, a prisoner, maybe. Yeah, no, 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 tell me this, but I'm in relation army. to a prisoner. I'm in a privileged position. No, army, 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 wars, yes. fighting. It's an industry. It's an industry. Yeah, but it's an industry. You're not answering the question. No, there is a, a terrible war going on in Syria and Iraq, uh, where ISIL forces, you know, are raping 
every woman they capture just about, as I hear, and they're cutting off the head of everyone who won't convert to their brand of Islam. <coughs> uh, so you're problematizing the, uh, uh, the approach of non-violence as such. Because yeah, I'm not sure how helpful this question <coughs> is. Again, yeah, because nobody into to a fundamental. You know, there are some mm. cases, are there some cases where killing another human being is appropriate, killing an animal is appropriate. Well, That's arguing from extreme cases, and Dr. Harnard already said that... Extreme cases yeah. are often used in psychology and psychiatry to prove a point. Okay. So, I'm an activist. Yeah. Every knowledge I have, every piece of knowledge I have, I try to apply to my own life, to make myself, uh, to do justice to the fact that I'm personally responsible for those at the mercy, uh, at my mercy. Could I jump in on this? Yeah, Thank on. you. Okay, uh, this is a non sequitur. I know that it was thrown to you in con this context, yes. and it's thrown to us in this context. It's a non sequitur. Let me give you a simple. The question, le the let me give a simple way of answering it in general. Mm. It is wrong to cause ne n suffering unnecessary, unnecessarily under any circumstances, including allowing suffering to be caused unnecessarily. And it's always to the best of your knowledge. If you ask me, should we go in and fight ISIL, I, my, my inclination is yes. Yes, because, it, because you, there's more suffering caused by letting them prevail than by suppressing them. But I don't know because uh, this is not my domain of specialization. When it comes to animals, I can say it is absolutely unnecessary to keep killing these animals. We have to stop. So the ISIL case is irrelevant. Well, that is just compartmentalizing. You say, this is my area. No. And therefore I'm going to be good in this area, but other areas... No, I said the, uh, the evidence is open and shut in the case of animals, and it's not obvious with ISIL. I incline towards fighting ISIL, but I don't know because it's not my specialty. Uh, uh, please don't say it's open and shut. It's your view it is open and shut, because that is still a controversy as far as I'm concerned, and many other people are concerned. You haven't been convincing. Well, I, I, on, what, on what is it that you're not convinced? The dietary aspects? You think it's necessary dietary to help? Aspects. Health experts, yes. Well, I suggest looking up, rather than looking up mm. abstruse areas of quantum mechanics, look up the actual dietetics <laughs> on, on uh, nutrition. Just we speaking, have a dietitian as, a, yeah, speaking as a dietitian, absolutely. The American Dietetic Association, Canadian Dietetic Association, do say, do admit, and these are non vegan speaking, that a well planned vegan diet can absolutely be beneficial to health. And if you look at the emerging research, it, it's saying that it reverses heart disease, cures diabetes. So, I mean, in our profession... Maybe you Whoa! Yeah. Will you? That was not very respectful, sir. <laughs> Sorry, this is an argument, isn't it? It's a discussion. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation. Blah, blah, blah is not an argument. <laughs> so, I, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're aware of dietetic knowledge and, and aware of diets that are... I mean, it's, it's just I'm speaking from fact. He, he was right. a doctor who was uh, treated many patients. He was talking the way here. It's, but it's he's, had a lot, he's had a lot of problems with vegetarians who have got into uh, ill health. And w I, I would absolutely agree. It doesn't mean that it has to be ill health. And, and there's just, I mean, if you're not eating, I, I talk about vegetarians, I talk about the egg and cheese trap. Because right. they take away meat, right. they just eat egg and cheese. There's low iron. Of course you're going to get into problems. Absolutely. That's why you need educated. And that's where this role mm -hmm. comes in in educating and advocating. So absolutely. But to generalize and say plant-based diets, I mean, you have to look at, and the, the head of the American Association of Cardiology is now a vegan. I mean, and he became vegan after seeing his patients reverse their own heart disease. And I, I think you get into the opinions of, I mean, Dr. Dr. Oz is a doctor. So I don't think you can throw the label that I, just because I'm a health professional, I have all the answers. I would rather look at the research, and I am from a master's point. So I, I'm looking at objective information. So it could be an opinion that you have, but... Yeah, I, I think that there's yeah, problems. Can I answer first issue? Can I just point out the yeah. well planned vegan diet that the American Dietetics Association uses that my father's patients might not actually be yes. planning their diet so well? Um, but keep going. Yes, but also, because trained as a scientist, I look at some of those papers and it is full of assumptions and jumps of logic which aren't really bad. I think that's not strictly a problem with vegan diets. I think that's a problem with nutrition. But because people report what they're eating. So you do have to make a lot of assumptions when you're doing dietetic research. It, and that's, it's, it's plagued with false, but I mean. Yeah, this is one of the problems, because it, it is it's not problem. convincing. 
Because I, I would disagree. Yeah, well, it's not convinced me. Well, but not you're one person, but I would... And how many vegans are there in the world? Uh, well, I think if you look at the population... How many vegans are here, by the way? <laughs> but I think if you look at the population of veganism, we've seen an increasing trend in the United yeah. States. I know, like, a jump from 1% to 2%. That's mm -hmm. double. Yeah. And I, I see my patients, They, when I talk to them about meat, it's always they know that they need to decrease their meat consumption. They are not even telling me. They are saying that, yes, I'm aware. And there's absolutely no need to. A well-planned, plant-based diet provides everything you need. Absolutely. And, and you're I, not... I, I disagree. Just to... Uh, just to well, I'd like to just, just make to, one comment. Yeah, and there, there's a question. Because about maybe that. it might be helpful in this to, uh, to self-reflect and introspect and meditate upon the question why you seem to be invested in the idea to continuing... Okay? I don't, am, I, I don't expect a quick answer but there, uh, or an easy answer, but there are reasons why we are so set so invested on the idea that non -eat, not eating animals is crazy. Okay? <laughs> yes, please. Question back. Yeah. Uh, sorry, there's a question I'm back. Really I'm really from. I've been standing for some time. He's at the mic and then you. Okay, yes, I have a question related to that. Uh, um, I, I'm seeking for uh, real ways to, uh, like, to evolve through the vegan uh, vegetarianism. But like I eat meat every day, and uh, it's deep inside me. It's it's cultural for me to eat meat. I understand that to be vegan would be probably better for, for me, but it's not natural for me to change. And I think change uh, would come with education. But is there a way to change fast, or will we change only with the next generations with education in schools and? The way you're posing the question, you're already there. This is really amazing. So you're taking personal responsibility. May I ask where you're from, what your cultural background is? I'm from uh, Saguenay in Quebec. In right, a, right. In a regular family. Uh, right. So what I would start off with is, the co it's, is those resources, those vegan foods that Quebecers already eat to make it feel, and, uh, uh, feel more natural. And then, of course, uh, look out for all the amazing uh, options that are out there, right? There are more and more and more vegan options. But um, there is amazing, what is it called, um, shepherd pie, vegan shepherd pie. This is Quebecois, all right, like pâté chinois. I mean, it tastes amazing, you know? So you can be a good Quebecer, right, and, and a vegan. And, and, and this is completely culturally coherent. Cultures, con they change. They progress, uh, they work with what they have, and they continuously invent and grow and change. So how long will it take to change everything? <laughs> for, for you or for the world? <laughs> <coughs> I think that I, I will be dead when uh, everyone will be vegan at the same time. Okay, but <laughs> let's, just, let's just concentrate on you becoming <laughs> vegan. Right. And, the, and let, let me just add to what Marion said. It's ridiculous ridiculously easy. It's, it's, we inflate it into a big deal because we don't do it. It's ridiculously easy. And the other thing I wanted to add is you said it was hard for you uh, to become a vegan. Let me tell you that it's much, much harder for the animals that are being killed for you not to be a vegan. Thank you. I think we have a question right here just because yes. we're not saying it was So, so uh, I, I'd like to take this discussion to s some generic and basic arguments. Um, as a, as a species, humankind, along with other animals, uh, they are divided into several categories, herbivores, carnivores, omnivores. I think human beings as an animal Omnivore. species falls into the third category. So, and by the way, I am transitioning into becoming a vegetarian. I'm almost there, maybe even vegan. But uh, just for the sake of argument, are you, are you suggesting that mankind, humankind as a species, should change its nature from being omnivores to being herbivores? Not at all. It should exercise its omnivore nature and its ability for choice. We've given up slavery, we've given up rape, we've given up torture, we've made them illegal. We are able to live healthy lives without hurting animals. Let's stop hurting animals. Again, for the same so the sake of argument, since we are a higher being than animals like lions and tigers, 
they're not going to stop eating their goats and the deer. But humankind should. Right? All right, as you said correctly, animals, especially lions and tigers and cats, domestic cats, are obligate carnivores. They have no choice to live. If they're being held under the water, in the imagine, they die if you don't feed them meat. That's not true of us. We are omnivores. We are, in fact, opportunistic carnivores or herbivores. Let us now exercise our choice, just like we stopped doing so slavery. Should the, should the meat eaters also have a choice to continue eating meat? Well, on the contrary, well, of course, we're not, we're not talking about legislating choice yet. That's a little bit too fascistic. But for those who claim that the reason they're ex exercising their omnivore choice to eat meat is because it's necessary for their health, or because it doesn't really hurt animals, that's false. I, I'm sure people enjoy eating it. It's not only for the diet. Orgasms. Yes, yes, we do it for orgasms, just as I said. Uh, I think we had a question around this side. Then maybe at the back again? Sure. Um, yeah, it kind of relates to uh, the question that was last posed over here. Um, uh, in, in a lot of uh, contemplative literature, uh, they talk about um, horizontal or, or incremental transformation um, versus, uh, versus vertical or kind of instantaneous realization. And I, I'm wondering uh, what kind of transformation you think is most relevant to, to the ethical treatment of other beings. And this kind of relates to, to meditation as well and sort of um, those, those moments of insight you know, versus kind of this, this long-term training and um, uh, uh, this, this progression, I guess. I think there's place for both. I was talking about um, transformation in the moment of encounter, an intersubjective encounter with the other. That might push or pull you in the right direction. If I said, however, that this is enough, that this encounter with that pig now enlightened me about the essence of pigs, well, I'm wrong. This would be reducing pigness into something abstract again. So I follow again in, in the footsteps of modern Jewish philosophers that say, no, 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 it's not about that. It's about me acknowledging that a pigs are complex, they're intelligent, they're, they're sentient, um, and that I will never know everything there is to know about pigs, and that this difference is something I, that, that should instill respect in me. So it's a process to interact with non-humans in an ethical way as much as engaging with, with humans, because others are just as complex as I am. How often do we actually, we tend to simplify and reduce other people around us. Oh, nobody understands my suffering. Oh, no. My suffering is the worst in the world. And it's just not like that, you see? So yeah, I think there is a place for both, a necessity for both. If I may make a comment here, it looks like that we are going in so many different directions. Um, and uh, I'm totally convinced that one should not knowingly hurt another being, be it animal, non-animal, and it doesn't have to be just killing. Now that's one element. I think I agree with on, on that on that on that uh, dimension. Now the other dimension is why do we eat meat? Uh, we eat actually meat. We like we like chicken or we like this. We like the other one. It's our desire that actually drives it. Now you actually meet a, a you know wandering somebody. You see a dead animal, right? And there's nothing else to eat, and you eat the meat out of that one. Now that doesn't actually contravene any principle from that point of view. So uh, uh, this whole thing about vegan, it's a, it's a choice that one makes. Uh, I, I, when it comes to the, uh, the, 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 if you actually analyze it in depth, it is the desire, our desire, as you quite rightly put it, our orgasm that we get when you eat chicken or whatever, Angus beef or whatever, that drives it towards that, right? And we buy these things in the in the, uh, the supermarket. Uh, I mean, we. But what actually? I, I understood everything you said. In the beginning, you said I think we shouldn't hurt animals. 
And, and then you said, we have this desire for meat. What is your own conclusion from this? The own conclusion, it is our desire that is actually driving some of these we, things. We know that. Right? I mean, that's everything. Yeah, we're we're, we we're hurting this? them because we, because we get pleasure out of, out of the product. But what's, the, what's your conclusion? Well, the point is that if you actually see a dead animal, right? And it, 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 completely it irrelevant. Become, completely completely irrelevant. Completely irrelevant. Vegan or not is irrelevant then. But it is irrelevant. That's also obvious. I'm looking for your point. We shouldn't be hurting. You, you seem to agree. You're, you're against hurting. We do hurt because we get pleasure out of it. I don't, you didn't express a view about that. You just stated it as a fact. We like the taste of meat. And we can eat roadkill. So what? I think, I, I, if I may paraphrase, uh, his point is that you cannot argue not killing animals and veganism at the same time. What he's saying is, I mean, you can eat roadkill. So then there's no argument about not eating animals. Yeah, that's right. We're talking about because not burning. And the roadkill just falls out of the sky randomly in a vacuum. Roadkill. There are causes for roadkill. No, We're just, expanding I'm, and I'm taking and taking more space point. as humans. Since, since uh, he, the gentleman didn't get his point, I was just trying to explain. Okay. He, he gave the example of a roadkill only as an example. The animals could die. Animals. I don't know how they would become available as meat. But That's right. Your point, and your point, your point, sir, is that they sh we should not kill them for meat, for eating. Well, I right? went further. I said we shouldn't or, hurt, or hurt them. Or hurt, hurt yeah, them. Even pets, right. But her point is about veganism. So you can still eat animals if they are not being killed by us. Yes, I, I invite you all to be, I invite you all to become vegans and eat all the road kill you in the <laughs> Well, that's not even funny. Excuse me. But roadkill, that's, that's us expanding, taking up more space, and killing animals. No, I think, I, think we are, I think we are going away from the whole topic of consciousness. When you are eating, effectively, you are eating something hard, you are something soft, and the, the five things that are, that are there, right? And that, we put labels to this, whether it is vegetable, meat, or anything like that. At the time, if you consciously, mindfully eat something, you're not eating meat, you're not eating vegetables, you're not eating anything, you're eating only those five things. It's the aggregate of which you put a label to. And then we have this all this argument whether somebody is vegan, vegan or not. I can't follow, uh, follow any of that. Okay. Well, we have a question. Different topic. Uh, now, uh, in evolution, our brains develop over time. There are studies showing that in primates, uh, the gorillas are about three times bigger, but they have a smaller brain. Where humans have a big, well-developed brain because uh, they eat meat over time of evolution. Is it true? Like, do you know the answer? No, part, you're, you're right. And the, cooking to them. You're right, the gorillas are bigger. Meat. You're right, the gorillas are bigger. They also have very big brains. I don't know what the no, proportion... No, it's a smaller, smaller brain right. then. I don't know what the proportion of the gorilla brain to the gorilla body is. They have, they have absolutely bigger brains than yeah, we do. The proportion is less. The pr proportion may be less. Mm -hmm. But what has that got to do with it? We certainly don't have big brains because we eat meat. No, the cooking and uh, the brain, the cortex, uh, cortex uh, the surface area is bigger because the scientists have shown because of eating the meat. And okay, okay. So I, I think okay. the argument that he, like Bernardo de Bruch, de Bruchsky at McGill, for example, would, as an evolutionary psychiatrist, would argue that there's this, as your harsh critic of evolutionary psychology, and I think correctly so, and I think that criti criticism could be applied here. But um, the cri the argument is that our surface area to um, so in our gut, our intestines to our brain is a product of it's allowed us to have shorter surface area in our gut and larger surface area in our brain as a result of eating cooked meat. Listen, so the argument listen, I edited a journal in which we regularly had papers speculating on why our brains are so big. Right. There's hundreds of these theories. Yeah, yeah. You pick one crackpot theory, there's many crackpot theories. Yeah. That's the, I think that's a fair argument. Oh, sorry, yeah. Question from the back. Yeah, there's a question in the back. And also just to, I mean, because these are all very controversial issues, we just need to make sure that we're all treating each other with respect and that, just, you know, obviously. <laughs> So that we can, uh, you know, continue this conversation afterwards and whatnot. Uh, question at the back. Yes, I um, I agree with many of the things you've been saying, um, but I feel one thing that perhaps is I I would love to see an Aboriginal person here who's living off the land, uh, whose traditional diet is uh, what seal or uh, whale or whatever. 
uh, who also see the killing of an animal as a spiritual act, who give thanks for that animal spirit, who are very, very respectful for what that animal has given. And although, you know, all the things you said about the pigs and whatever, I agree, but I think, you know, people in that kind of situation, I think it's, I would just love to hear what they have to say about um, this um, topic. I have just a quick one. Subsistence hunters, Inuit uh, Aboriginals, etc., are not the ones that we're addressing over here. We're talking to you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So about empathy, again. Um, so what do you think are the larger inhibitors of empathy towards others? I was going to propose maybe that one of them could be personal suffering. So if a person is not achieving a high enough quality of life to feel, I guess, generally good or have a general quality of life, could that prevent them from feeling empathic and behaving empathic towards other humans and non-human animals? Or do you think it's something that could happen regardless of one's state of life or, or psychology? Uh, what's your background? Is it psychology or? Social work or psychology, neuroscience. I see, I see. So this is a this is okay. A pragmatic question. It's more honestly out of curiosity. I want to know what you believed and maybe if you had a suggestion or whether it was because I don't know the studies on empathy and mm -hmm. I don't know whether there's a correlation between quality of life and ability to feel empathic. I honestly am ignorant about it, but I'm just thinking mm -hmm. there could be. That's possible. Okay. If anyone else has an answer. Does one have to have good quality of life to behave empathically to others? Oh, to behave? Yes. Sorry, well, I wasn't very clear. Oh, okay. Well. Remember the, the meaning of life, right? Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're sick, or you're being oppressed, or your loved ones are being oppressed, you're not in a position to be out there saving the, the errant cats of Montreal. Okay? The, the empathy, in a sense, is, is a luxury of people whose basic needs are satisfied, okay? And that's what we're talking. When I say that I'm addressing you, I, I assume most of you are not suffering from fatal illnesses, nor are any of your members of your family. Those are the people we're talking to. The, the, uh, the slaughterhouse workers, I don't completely agree with Marion about that. Marion seems to have as much empathy for the slaughterhouse workers as for the, as for the ones they're slaughtering. I don't have quite that much empathy. I know that there are, there are immigrants who come here who are duped into working at slaughterhouses, dis and, and they can't take it after a while. Those people really are victims. They're like the one who's held under the water. If you want to eat, you have to go out here and kill these pigs. But most slaughterhouse, wor wor workers, slaughterhouse workers are not in that category. There is a choice there. You can decide whether you want, want to become a pimp or not, and you can decide whether you want to become a slaughterhouse worker or not. In French, it's called a sale métier. And by the way, it attracts sadists, and it produces sadists. I think in slaughterhouse workers, I've seen all box of people, not necessarily immigrants. So, and also they have a choice. They have a choice whether it be an immigrant or not. They have a choice to quit their job. If they do not want to kill, they well, can do that. Well, but the star they karma. Now I can be one of you, a spiritualist, or the starving immigrant whose family can't eat. And the only thing they offer him on the work line that morning is to take him to a bleak slaughterhouse. He doesn't have much Why choice. Why starving immigrant? Why can't it be a starving anybody? Because I'm trying to pick a case of necessity. I'm trying to pick one where there's nothing that you can do except this sale métier. But, but it's, this is not true of the majority of the people who do it. It's a, a true of a minority. point is that we cannot just say it's it's uh, it's up to us as consumers to make us choices. It's up to us, it's up to you. It's our responsibility to learn about these topics and these issues as much as we can uh, and to not just to come to easy conclusions. Right? To make an informed decision. Yeah. To not be lazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. To make an informed decision by ourselves. We have the power. Uh, Go ahead. I'd be curious to know both of your positions uh, on ethical uh, or quote unquote cruelty free animal products such as dairy or eggs and if those are permissible. They're not cruelty. 
do, uh, like, can I take this? Because of course. Look, I, the reason I said I was ashamed of being a vegetarian, I was a vegetarian for 50 years, was because I was here at McGill four years ago in the, in the symposium on animal law that um, this lawyer, Wolfson, a lawyer from Yale or Columbia, explained to me, I, I was supposed to be a university professor with knowledge and intelligence, about he, it, the way he did it was, he said, you're all here for a symposium on animal law. I would now like to address myself to the vegetarians in the audience. Do you realize that the industry that's supplying your eggs and your uh, dairy is in fact doing the worst abominations of all, and it subsumes the meat industry. Not only are you tormenting cows beyond belief, keeping them alive for only four years, tearing away their calves as soon as they're born, two days after they're born, keeping them and the calves in agony, you're killing and eating the, the calves, and on top of that, four years after the cow is spent and it has no more, it's, it's um, udders are full of lesions and, it's, and it pus is coming out of its, of, out of its uh, 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 um, What's the name? Udders. Udders. Uh, it's pushed by 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 crane to be slaughtered. That's what you're that's what you're buying into when you're being a vegetarian, having only dairy. So, vegan is the only option. I completely understand that, but are are there any pragmatic ways to consume dairy in a way that you would deem ethical? Nothing, nothing uh, that scales. I mean, I suppose you could live in nature and you could have, you could make friends with a with a wild cow, which sometimes comes over and you grab her udder, uh, and, she, and it doesn't harm her or her calf. But that doesn't scale to a planet of seven and a half billion people. Does organic mean anything? No difference whatsoever. That's a good question. Yeah, there will be more discussion at the end, and I'm really sorry, Tanya, I'm sure I had uh, more things to say. Um, we will be having a brief uh, lab meditation, I believe, now, and then we're going to have lunch, and then we will have a group discussion again at the end of the day where a lot of these questions can be brought up again if people are still uh, curious. Um, so, sorry to cut things off, and I think yeah, I'll so, yeah, grab some seats and we'll have a uh, trumpet on the front of the meditation. Thank you. Yeah. And this meditation is